So everybody knows what this is, right? It's a pendulum. It's influenced by the force of gravity. And uh, it swings from two extremes before settling in the middle again. That's an equilibrium. But that's just the mechanical motion. That's a mechanical explanation of a uh, pendulum. Today I'm going to be talking about how that applies to our lives, how it has deep implications to our own lives, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my own experiences uh, going to both sides of my own internal pendulum, my cultural pendulum of being a Chinese-American filmmaker uh, who is equal parts Chinese, uh, have a Chinese heritage, and an American upbringing. So, uh, back in 2008, when I was a senior in college at UCSD, I took this class that changed my life. It was uh, the history of the People's Republic of China, taught by Professor Paul Pickowitz, who's gone on and become a dear friend of mine. And in this class, uh, I remember he had these office hours where these students would come and uh, ask him all these different questions about the class. And so I went to this office hours once, and a student had asked him, hey, Professor Pickowitz, you know when China is going to be a democracy someday? Can you give a timeline? And Professor Pickwood said, I don't think so. I don't think I can do that and be honest with myself. Take a look at the history. A hundred years ago, China was considered the sick man of Asia. It was ravaged internally by warlords and dominated externally by foreign aggression. Now take a look now. We're all witnesses to this miracle of economic growth, the second largest economy in the world. A hundred years ago, China couldn't feed its own people, yet now, the problems that China does have to deal with are those of excess. No one could have predicted it. And Paul went on to say something. He said, every country has its own internal pendulum. This pendulum goes from one extreme to the other. And in China's case, it went from one extreme 100 years ago to this other extreme, a reaction to that previous extreme. Now, in order for countries to basically settle in the middle, this equilibrium, it needs to be able to go to both extremes before calibrating and going back into the middle. Well, I think this has far-reaching implications in my own life as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how that has applied to my own life. And um, I was filming uh, with a Chinese crew from Beijing uh, for a Chinese client. We spoke strictly in Mandarin. Uh, we had tea together. We drank and dined with local officials. And, uh, in three weeks, uh, a friend of mine, Nat Geo Explorer, uh, Ben Horton, invited me to go to Kauai to shoot and surf with uh, big wave surfer Laird Hamilton. So that's what I'm going to be doing in three weeks. These projects couldn't be more different from each other. Uh, three weeks ago, I was sitting having tea with Chinese government officials. And in three weeks, I'm going to be out in the sun and the surf doing something that I personally love, having grown up in Southern California. I mean, how do I make sense of these two extremes that I'm constantly going between? Well, I'll give you a little background about myself. I was born in China, in the southwestern province of Yunnan. Uh, but I came to the US at such a young age that I have no recollection of my home country at all. Um, but my parents did believe in kind of passing on their cultural heritage to me as when I was a child. So consequently, you know, in elementary school, while we're reading Shel Silverstein and Roald Dahl on the weekdays, on the weekends, my mom and dad would be saying, oh, you know what, you can't go out and play basketball, you can't go out and play baseball. You gotta stay home and learn how to read and write and do calligraphy. Now, that didn't make any sense for me as a 10-year-old boy. You know, I, all I wanted to do was just go out and play basketball. But now that I'm a filmmaker, you know, I tell stories. And the backbone of every story is structure. So, in, in story structure, typically we have a beginning, middle, and end. But that can also be called the origin, conflict, and resolution. You can pause it. Um, we can also call this the thesis. Thesis is the beginning. Then you have your conflict, which is the antithesis. Before you come to a resolution, where the antithesis has challenged the thesis, and we've come to a synthesis. This has far-reaching implications. It's the pendulum theory. So, for myself, at the time when I was a kid, uh, my thesis was that of my American life, being confused, not knowing why my parents had given me this, laid onto me this culture that I didn't really need. It wasn't until I was at UCSD taking this PRC history class that something happened. Um, 
And you flash forward to that, the end of that class, at the end of the quarter, Paul Pickowitz had invited a couple of us students to go to a dinner at a local restaurant. That restaurant, I met Albert Lin, who is going to be speaking later today. Um, Albert regaled us with his stories of living in Mongolia with the horse nomads in yurts. I mean, I was completely captivated that night. I couldn't go, I mean, I went home and I couldn't sleep. I realized that these were discoveries that Albert had made for himself, and they had become a part of who he was. Why couldn't I go out and do the very same thing? So I made a decision. After I graduated, I moved to Shanghai. Uh, it was the best decision I've ever made, because those two years in Shanghai taught me one thing. It taught me the other side, the antithesis of my American life. Uh, when I was in Shanghai, instead of surfing every day like I did at UCSD, literally every day at UCSD. I was, uh, I didn't go to class, no. Um, instead of surfing every day, I was weaving my scooter through the schizophrenic traffic known, I mean, in Shanghai. Instead of speaking English exclusively, uh, which is what I did in the US, those two years I spoke almost exclusively Mandarin. Um, and so, it was like another door had opened to me, this door that was at once alien, yet familiar. And I knew deep down that this door would stay open for the rest of my life, whether or not I liked it, whether or not I wanted to admit it or not. So um, my pendulum was still swinging. It was calibrating. It was self-correcting. And uh, towards the end of my stay in Shanghai, um, I decided, you know what, just knowing the language and understanding the cultural syntax wasn't enough. I wanted to kind of explore other areas. So I took some time and I backpacked parts of the Silk Road. Uh, I had tea with Kyrgyz nomads. And at the same time, I got to go to this place in southwestern China. The foothill of the Himalayas were the Mosul people. China's last matriarchal society resided. They were of a different ethnicity from Han Chinese people. Okay, which were 99% of uh, China. Now, what was really interesting is I could, have, I could relate to these people. Why? Because they had their own native cultures, and then they had this culture that they needed to basically assimilate into mainstream Chinese society. And they were still trying to figure out exactly where they were uh, as a part of this big picture. So I could relate to that. You know, I, I had two cultures as well, and obviously I couldn't completely assimilate into Chinese culture. Um, so, you know, I came back from Shanghai and I made a very crucial decision. I felt like as, as a filmmaker, what I needed to do was to be able to make films that could be a conduit, a bridge uh, for these two cultures. I mean, there's so much that gets lost in the cultural and linguistic syntax uh, between China and the U.S., so much. And knowing the cultural and linguistic syntax for myself was just a tool. I mean, tools get dull by misuse. So I needed to find a purpose for this tool. Um, I believe deep down that China and the US, Chinese people and Americans are very similar. We all have the same needs and wants. We all have the same dreams to have a better life, to essentially be self-sufficient, to love each other. And so I decided to make a documentary film. And for the next two years, uh, I was on and off in the uh, the foothills of the Himalayas, living with my crew uh, in these villages of the Mosul, where there was sometimes no cellular reception and uh, no, uh, no electricity. But through being there and experiencing what life was like for these people, I had an intimate understanding of where they were, where they were going. Um, my work eventually got uh, recognized by National Geographic. I got an Explorer's Grant and eventually later became a freelance uh, photographer and filmmaker for National Geographic. So, I mean, in April, I'm going to be finishing up this film. And this film is going to require one last leg where I go to their, the last traditional Mosul village with my crew and we're going to be taking a 14-day trek via horse caravan to the place of their ancestors in the lower Himalayas. Um, in three weeks, I'm going to be going to Hawaii um, to check out what Laird Hamilton's up to. And these opportunities couldn't have been given to me if I didn't go and explore the two sides of my own pendulum, the two extremes of my own internal pendulum. So I want to challenge you guys. Uh, 
What drives you? What's your own internal pendulum? What are the places, what are the, the, the influences that are driving you in different directions? And how can you coalesce these? We have left, right, middle, right? We have the beginning, middle, and we have origin, we have conflict, and we have resolution. Thank you.